So we're going to continue what we were talking about. Father, I think that maybe you picked up on that Father Ripperger is giving you the principles, and then I'm taking you back into the protocol. And so the principles apply. So where we are in the protocol, if you remember, you remember those old Western cereals? Every week they'd say, meanwhile, back at the ranch. So meanwhile, back in the protocol, we've just finished phase one, and we've determined that if things stay, this, if they get better, keep doing what's bringing you improvement. If they stay the same, it's probably primarily psychological. Now let's examine that for just a minute, <clears throat> because Father talked about psychological compatibility. And because you identify something as being psychological or primarily psychological does not mean you're out of the woods, okay? And so um, this is another thing that's moved into the church that um, is not a traditional response, and that is it's not either spiritual or psychological. It's not an either or, it's a both and. And so when you understand that it's a both and, here's a couple of things to understand about the both and. The demon does not cause the psychological or mental health issue. So let me say that again. The demon does not cause the psychological or mental health issue any more than he causes the physical disease. He can mimic symptoms, but he can't cause the actual disease. But what he does do is he takes credit for the disease or the mental health issue or the psychological malady, and then he exacerbates it. And so here's another way to put it. Did any of you ever hear your mama say, don't pick that, it won't heal? All of us. So lots of wisdom. And it was her mother that told you, offer it up. Both of those are absolutely true and they're applicable in the spiritual realm. <clears throat> so what you find out is if you're, it doesn't get better, the indicator is that the primary issue is a psychological issue. What we found was the number one psychological problem or mental health problem is a rejection of reality. So let me say that again. The, the number one psychological or mental health problem is a rejection of reality. So you got one of three issues if you've got a reality problem. You've got one of three responses. Number one is you can change your personality to conform to reality. I would suggest that one. <laughs> number two is to continue in a, a downward spiral of psychosis. And number three is substance abuse. So number three alters reality. Number two alters your perception to reality. Number one conforms you to reality. And so let me give you a primary example because mental health um, is something that we don't talk about. It has a stigma to it. And so what is reality? Reality is God. It's providence. It's those things that you cannot change, nor should you try to. So the first level of reality, God in, the, in creation, the first level of identity, is called the specifics of your identity. And then there are the accidentals. The specifics of your identity, God chooses. What are the specifics? The gender, the ethnicity, the very family, the conception that he sends your soul to, God chooses that. God chooses it. So this is the first place that the demons suggest that we should reject reality. How many of you have heard you were born to the wrong family, the wrong time, the wrong culture, the wrong ethnicity, the wrong gender? How many of you heard that? It's called propaganda broadcast. And, and so if you respond to that, now you are open to what Father was talking about, psychological compatibility. How do you resist that? 
Number one is you reject it. Talking snake. Just beat it with a stick. Talking snake. If my Scott grandmother had been Eve, all of sacred scripture would be a trifold brochure with a big picture. Because she would have said, talking snake. So I don't care what he says. That ain't right. So I was asked on a radio show a couple of weeks ago about gender dysphoria. I can barely spell gender. I can't even get close to spelling dysphoria. So I asked the, the host, I said, what exactly do you mean by that? He said, well, con confusion about your gender. I said, I am not confused. <laughs> and so liter literally, look on your birth certificate. Because in that moment, someone smarter than you, someone with a degree in medicine, looked at you and said, that's a girl. <laughs> that's a boy. There's also other information on your birth certificate. Who your mama is, who your daddy is, when you were born, what time you were born, what race you are. There's all kinds of valuable information that if you're confused, just go back to... What does the label say? <laughs> now, as we say that, and we're, a lot of us are laughing, and, and, and rightly so, because it's absurd what's, what's happened in our society. It's absolutely absurd. But this shows the, the psychological compatibility. Oh, incidentally, I'm, I'm identifying as a seven foot three black supermodel. <laughs> Well, you're laughing at me? I'm not sure how I feel about that. But the absurdity illustrates exactly what I'm, my point. Because when these people start turning away from reality, they're actually severing the flow of grace. Actual grace is that medium of communication between creature and creator. And the receptors are your ability to accept reality. And you may say, God doesn't love me because he sent me to a really, really bad family. He made you. He made you. What do you think? He's turning out souls? <laughs> that was not so good. No. He made you and he sent you with a specificity. The specificity he sent you with was the same one he sent his son. The maximum salvific effect if you will join your life to his. Many weak souls like me got an exemplar father. Wonderful, beautiful man. All I ever wanted to do was be like my granddad, my dad, my uncles. My heroes were always cowboys and that's all I ever wanted to be. But for stronger souls, he sent them to a more challenging situation. And so they got maybe an abusive father, maybe a father who abandoned them. And in that absence, the ideal is accentuated. So we either get exemplar or we get an absence. How many of you know the young man who had a horrible childhood, maybe even an abusive childhood, and he's an exemplary husband or father? How many of you know him? He's out there. Where does that come from? We say things that are supposed to make people feel better, like you can't give what you don't have. How many people in this room have said that? Oh, come on. Well, it's absolutely false, because that's exactly what God's asking us to do, to give what we don't have. St. Paul, I am where I am weak, you are strong. And so... Where does this come from that this young man or young woman has turns this around? This is what Father's talking about, breaking generational sin, breaking the sins of a generation. Someone willing to be Christ and do it right. The demon out of justice says you need to get even. I don't think so. How many of you have know somebody who is angry at God 
And they're trying to get even. They're trying to get even. I think this is probably one of the psychological compatibilities that, that is most obvious and most difficult to address. So we're in phase two. We've talked about psychological compatibility, but as we move into phase two, what we did is we looked at all the data set, the huge data set of what keeps people from achieving liberation. So in a medical model, if you're looking at a medical malady and how it affects a population, what you're looking at is treatments, responses, what are the things that keep people from getting well? And so what we did was we said, what are the impediments or obexes to grace? What's interrupting the flow of grace into this person's life? And so we, we divided them up in, uh, in order of occurrence. What I mean by that is like percentage. So I'm going to give them to you in the order that we found. And so the most common that keeps people... Now remember, if we're in phase two, we're, we've decided that it, we've diagnosed that it's at least an obsession if not a possession. So is everybody clear with the language that I'm using? We go from oppression, one, two, three, obsession, one, two, three, possession, one, two, three. So there's three gradations of affliction, and within the three gradations, there's three different levels. Everybody with me? Okay. So there is a clear delineation or landmark condition of the soul that moves from oppression to obsession. And the, the reason I'm making such a point about this, oppressions are addressed through the protocol if you just keep doing the prayer and the discipline. If we've got a religious context and the affliction is increasing, now we have an obsession. So we know we've got at least that. Everybody following the methodology? Good. So the landmark symptom that we're looking for or the thing that's present in all cases greater than oppression is retained mortal sin. Retained mortal sin. So sacramental mathematics. It's a math problem, stated problem, does not involve a train. <laughs> you go into the confessional with two mortal sins. You confess one. How many do you come out with? Three. Three. For the Europeans here, three. <laughs> so how do I get there? The, the two that I went in with, plus I've now profaned the sacrament. So if I go into the confessional and I say, Father... Forgive me, I did this and this. There's another sin, but I'm not quite through with that one. That's essentially what we're saying. I'm not quite through with that one. I'm still mad at Uncle Bob. I still can't forgive Aunt Tilly. Whatever it is, retain sin. So what's happening is we are sabotaging the sacrament. We are actually denying the very grace that can heal us. I don't care if you've got to confess it every time you go. Keep confessing it, because if you're retaining a sin, you're not open to grace. This acts as an impediment, if not an obex, to grace. Forgiveness is not a one and done. It's a decision that's made daily. Sometimes hourly, sometimes every 10 minutes. But what forgiving does is it sets you free from the event. It cuts you loose from the event, the perceived offense, whatever that may be. Remember we, we quoted that sage Bojangles in the last section? Most people just think about they sell. So their offense to you may have been collateral, unintended, but this idea of being offended 
all retained sin is related to a perceived offense over which we are demanding justice or vengeance, and we sabotage the sacrament. So there's two different ways that we sabotage, there's three different ways we sabotage the sacrament of, con of confession. Number one is we retain a sin. So it's an incomplete confession. Number two is we do not have contrition. How many of you got the four-year-old boys, you pull them apart, one of them's got a bloody nose, one of them's got the swollen up lip, and you say, look, you've got to tell your brother you're sorry. Sorry. <laughs> what, I'm the only one that... <laughs> so would you say that boy had imperfect contrition? He ain't even got the first bit of contrition. <laughs> so there's a difference between repentance and regret. Regret is, I'm sorry, I got caught. <laughs> Repentance is, I'm sorry that this damaged our relationship. Now let's go deeper and further. Contrition is the realization that what I have done has damaged the relationship between God and me. Compunction, $2 word that we don't use anymore, compunction is the realization of the damage my sin does to others. Because none of us sin in a vacuum. It impacts the mystical body of Christ. It impacts our families. And I will tell you straight up, men, if you are not in a state of grace, you can't discharge your duty as a husband and as a father. Because your primary duty is to tell clean from unclean. You will not recognize that the clothing your daughter is wearing is immodest if you are looking at things that are immodest. Very simple. And it gets in your house because you let it in there. We as men think that we're protection. If I say, do you protect your house? We all get this image, 3 o'clock in the morning, standing at the top of the stairs with a ball bat in my boxer shorts, nobody's getting by me. <laughs> Real protection is going around. How many of you do the dad thing where you check the lights and the windows and the doors? Yep, 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 yep. So when you do that, make the sign of the cross on those openings. Lord, protect this house. Lord, protect this house. Bless your children. Do you pray over them when they're sleeping? Best time. They don't fidget. <laughs> That's protecting your family. Is saying prayers, staying pure. Because the merit of a man's prayer is directly related to his purity. It's that simple. And so in this phase two, that's one of the features of phase two, is the man of the house begins to bless his, his wife, his children, and bless his house. We redress the retained sin. Chief among retained sin is the lack of forgiveness. And the subcategory of that is an animosity or hatred toward the person who offended us. If you do this, you are cutting yourself off from grace. It's in the Our Father. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's real simple. It's not the other way around. Our mercy, the mercy that flows to us, is dependent upon us first extending mercy. An act of the will which says, I will no longer hold this against this person. And the most meritorious claim to give up is the just claim. Is the just claim. Give it up. It's amazing the freedom. So that's number one, retain sin. The next one is failures in to sever relationships. Our Lord says two things. In Matthew 18, he says, I come with a sword, not to unite, but to divide, to set father against son and mother against daughter. Do you remember that part? Oh, yeah. yeah, that doesn't get quoted too much, does it? I don't go with the wavy gravy, feel good Jesus. But he's telling you straight up. What does he mean, I come to divide? To make you choose. Want to make you choose. 
He says again, who are my brothers and sisters? Those who keep my father's commandments. He's asking us constantly to reorder ourselves, reorder our families. What is our first level of family? Is those who are like-minded in the faith. So this is one of the things that holds people in bondage more than anything else. It's familial bonds that are unholy. So then we go through a formula of rejecting, renouncing, and rebuking. The rejecting, renouncing, and rebuking formula says that we all have ties to a previous life or time when we were not in right relationship to God. How many of you in the bottom of that drawer, way back in the bottom, you still got that Grateful Dead t-shirt? <laughs> yep. How many of you do that thing with your bottom lip when you hear born to be wild? <laughs> we were not born to be wild. These are the things that I'm talking about. They're material things and spiritual things that tie us to a previous life and a time when we were not in right relationship with God. This is one of the big problems with tattoos and piercings. Is it ties us to a time, and it's a, a reminder, it's an instant reminder of when we were not in right relationship with God. So you have to re address those things. Reject, renounce, and rebuke. And several relationships that are not consistent with your faith. And that may be in your family. I'll point out something to you. Do you realize that it is Saturday afternoon in Southern California and you're in a school gymnasium talking about demons? Do you realize that? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're fanatics. <laughs> and there are people in your family who will back me up on that. You're, yeah, you're a member of the largest cult in the universe. <laughs> it's true. The point is you've made a choice. One of the biggest lies out there is that blood is thicker than water. How many of you ever heard it? The blood of family is not as thick as the water of baptism. And so this will help you take that clear path and choose the good. So it's a reject, renounce, and rebuke formula. It's getting rid of the Grateful Dead t-shirt. It's getting rid of all those things that tie you back to a time in your life when you were not in right relationship with God. 